Guess what the trash brought me? Me again. Mungwa. You know. The winter view, so to speak. Now, I'm not the winter feeling by choice. This is by selection. Your favorite group of, you know, I don't even know what to call them. But, well, they selected their favorite feeling for the winter. In the winter of 2022, that would be the Purple People's Hour. Congratulations. It's better than making the fourth 100 list. I guarantee you that. Anyway, enough about me. We're talking about Ukraine. Ukraine. And Ukraine, oddly enough, has a lot to do with uh, the purple people's out. Now, you're thinking, what does Ukraine have to do with me, you, or anybody besides Ukraine and Russia. Let me do a little refresher. Firstly, Ukraine has been a country that's been war-torn for quite some time. Quite some time. It seems every century we find ourselves right back in the same situation with Ukraine and Russia. And there's a whole host of characters, so to speak, in this story. You only hear about the Ukrainian and the Russian people. But there's more characters in the story. There always has been. What I don't understand is this. It's a simple notion. When you don't want to be East, because you don't feel that the East fully envelops and recognizes who you truly are, and then, you don't want to be West, because the West doesn't really value anything of your cultural identity. At least the East picks up on that. But the West presents a more liberal approach, a more leave me the fuck alone type of approach. Let me be me. Let me do what I want to do. So it's a conundrum. When you're not fully vested in one of those two ideologies. When you're not fully east. And you're not fully west. It's almost like the Crips and the Bloods, the East Coast, West Coast thing. It's kind of the same thing, but only with a Ukrainian-Russian type of feel to it. You see, there's such stark differences. There always has been. There's been people that are for independence. They want nothing to do with the Soviet Union, Russia. They want nothing to do with the mother. They're like, you abandoned us. You left us to starve to death, literally. I don't know if you know this, but six to eight million people in 1931 to 1933 in Ukraine. Six to eight million of them starved to death. There was a famine. 
the vast majority of the people who starved, contrary to what history loves to state, the vast majority of them to start weren't Russians. They were actually Ukrainian peasants, what we would consider or call peasants at that time. Now we don't use that type of terminology. We say low-wage workers, poor people, marginalized communities, historically oppressed people. Well, they starved to death in Ukraine. Four to five million Ukrainians died of a famine. It hasn't even been a whole entire century since that happened. Less than a century. And so, here it is, Russia. You got the president of Russia. I gotta be careful what I say. You never know who might pop in and watch these things. You got the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin. They just took Kazakhstan. They just took it back. They got Crimea back. And now they were like, there's only one more thing left on the to-do list. The task, so to speak. We gotta take back Ukraine. The only problem with that is, Ukraine still remembers the family. You still got people in Ukraine that like being associated with the West. Don't necessarily want to fuck with the West, but they like the association that comes with it. And they don't really want to be under the dictates of Russia. They sort of kind of want to do their own thing. Kind of like a child that's like a teenager, 19 years old. They don't want to still live in their parents' basement or attic or garage. They want their own place. Even if it's tiny in New York City, they want their own fucking space. They want to be able to walk around on a Sunday morning completely in the buff and be happy about it. That's Ukraine in a nutshell. They want to be able to do their own thing without Russia and Putin looking over them with a magnoscope, eyeing every little thing that they do, being ready to chastise critique. But the thing is, here's where the catch-22 comes into play. If you don't want to be the East, and you don't want to be the West, and the East in Russia really wants you to come back, and the West is like, no, you really want to be with us. My first thought is, has anybody done like a simple survey of the people of Ukraine to see what their opinion is? Whether they want to be associated with the East or whether they want to be associated with the West. Now I know what some people are going to say. Start with people that. Who would you survey? This is simple. I would survey Ukrainian women. And the reason I say it's simple is because it's something that we've already done. You don't think that I would tell you to do something 
but I had to know what he done and need an assessment before I came to do the presentation. I'm very astute what I do. Unlike you, some of you who are just sloppy and haphazard and do things in a well questionable way to say the least. Anyway, in order to gauge sentiment anywhere on the ground, you always survey women. I don't really need the input and advice of the individuals who are always perpetual, ready to fight. Ukrainian men and Russian men have been fighting wars since they were little kids. I'm not surveying them. I know what their intention is. They hate each other and they want to fight. I need to survey people who are neutral, who don't have strong feelings, one way or the other, about fighting. Because I'm looking for some other kind of data, something underneath the surface, so to speak. And what do you know? I found the information. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions about Ukraine. Let's take the capital city, Kiev. Now, the thing I like about capital cities is very simple. It gives you a lot of information because that's where mostly young people are going to live. I can worry about the sentiment of older people, and that's bad. But younger people are going to be the ones that are here for a lot longer time. So that's the sentiment I'm going to get. So I told you who I serve in. Young Ukrainian women. And the data was fascinating. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be, so to speak. It was very interesting. Not to get into the methods and modalities of how we collect information, data, and intelligence. We can never share those things, and I never will. Here's what we discovered, and this is very interesting. Listen up. Ukrainian women. feel some type of way, shame, guilt, sorrow for Ukrainian men. So there's no kind of going back on that. They sort of kind of turn their back to Ukrainian men. There's a lot of alcoholism and domestic violence between Ukrainian men and Ukrainian women. In partnerships, relationships, and just male-female, male-non-binary, male-trans interactions. Russians and Ukrainian they butt heads too much. Unless you're pro-Russia and you're a Ukrainian. Then you get on well with Russian individuals. But you have a lot of people in the capital city of Ukraine, Kiev, who want to do their own thing. So they don't even really fuck with Russian men. So that's going to be interesting if you have some kind of incursion that does happen between Russia and Ukraine. Because Ukrainian women are not even really all that familiar with Russian men. Especially the age of the men 
world fighting age that would be coming to Ukraine. They're not going to like that at all. So, that's one data point to look at. The other data point is interesting too. See, this is why data is fascinating. Because you learn a lot of things if you just listen. Ukrainian women want green cards. Now everybody is like, that's a stereotype. But it's true, they do. But why is the West so stingy at giving green cards to Ukrainian women? Well, the West doesn't really want a lot of Ukrainian women in Western countries because they don't necessarily feel that Ukrainian women are truly westernized women. There's some role blockage there. Remember, it goes back to not wanting to be East, but also not wanting to be West. And remember, I told you this involved us too, because I'm not East nor West. And you gotta really listen up to this one. If you're not East or West, there's certain entities that try to put you in a box and label it East, label it West, and just will throw you in the box and tell you, you are definitely East, you are definitely West. Don't get it confused. And Ukrainian women absolutely abhorred that with a passion. So the West doesn't give green cards to Ukrainian women because Ukrainian women don't want to be put in a Western box. What do I mean by a Western box? Well, Western men say that they're about marriage and commitment and relationships. And Ukrainian women, when they get to the West, they find out that that's all bullshit. And so enough Ukrainian women have come to the West and seen how the game is really run. And they've gone back home and said, you know, it's not all this cut out to be in the West. So maybe we should do our own thing. Kind of like stay here in Ukraine and create our own type of what we want. Something uniquely Ukrainian for Ukrainian women. And this has rubbed the good old boys in the West the wrong way. It's rubbed the good old boys in the East the wrong way. And it's really the underlying reason why you have Cold War rhetoric going. See, you didn't think I knew these things. But we know a lot. We know a lot. Now, well, let's go back to the people in the land. Which one's more important? Does Putin want the land? Which land is a resource. Ukraine is a resource, territory-wise. Where does he want the land and the people? Because if all he wants is the land, well, have at it, baby. Take the land, and the West will take the people, right? We'll welcome refugees, Ukrainian refugees. Because you can't say that you want Ukraine to be part of the West and then not welcome Ukrainian refugees. Just like we welcome Afghan refugees. We'll see if we really welcome them. They just arrived. 
Welcoming doesn't mean that you allow somebody in. It also means that you have a hospitable spirit towards them when you see them. You're like, oh, you're new to my country. Let me befriend you and show you things that I enjoy about this country. That endears more gratitude to not only the person, but the nation itself. Are Americans hospitable? Are the English hospitable? Are the French hospitable? Are the Germans hospitable? Are the Japanese hospitable? Are the Chinese hospitable? Everybody should be welcoming Ukrainian refugees. You know, Ukrainian women add a lot of value. I know a lot of people just think they're brides for hire. But Ukrainian women are some of the smartest women in terms of certain things. Really smart. So, is the West going to be hospitable and provide green cars to Ukrainian people? If that's the case, then who can have the land? Sure, the land is important. But you say that the Ukrainian people want to get a green card to come to the West. So this is a win-win for everybody. It doesn't have to be a lose-lose situation. It doesn't have to get messy. But maybe it will get messy for another reason entirely different than what we've gone over. There was something else that was told to me. It wasn't in the data. And I was disappointed. Because I had to go fetch this. Personally, I had to go and fetch this. And I don't like personally going and fetching things. We're in a pandemic. It's dangerous. Do you know we can't really move about as much as we used to anymore. None of us can. Not solely based out of the dangers external, but also internally. I'll leave it at that. Intelligence sometimes is a matter of weight. There was something else. You see, back in 1917, you had civil unrest, civil wars, different factions formed in Ukraine. There were six factions that formed in Ukraine. And I was very interested in each one for different reasons. There was a Ukrainian fraction. You know, they wanted their independence. They were pro-Ukrainian. There was a pro-Russian Ukrainian faction. Then there was a French faction in Ukraine. Then there was the Poles, the Polish faction in Ukraine. Then there was the Whites. They were just described as the Whites, a faction in Ukraine. And then the last faction was the Anarchists. Now remember, we talked about Kiev, the capital city. This is going to be very important. In one year, five out of those six factions took power between 1917 and 1919. Five 
out of those six factions took power in one year. So they were constant overthrows. Nobody could really govern. Because every time one faction got in, the other faction was plotting to overthrow it. And in one year, you get overthrown five times, five different governments. That's complete chaos. So I'm not sure why the anarchists weren't running it the whole entire time. Because that's complete anarchy. You get the picture I'm starting to paint. The volatility, the instability, the nobody knows who's really running the show kind of thing. Anything goes. Can you get why that would create sadness, depression, anxiety, insanity? Ukrainian women are very sad and depressed. And the only thing that makes them happy is drinking and going clubbing and dancing. Now, you say, that's shallow. Well, when you get people that just want to fight and kill each other, Simply because, well, they're not from that particular street or that particular area. You talk about gang violence in the United States. Maybe a century ago, Ukraine made Al Capone look like Bozo the Clown. There's a natural animus in Ukraine towards any civility. The only thing that holds that country up is young Ukrainian women. Putin can't handle the volatility and the instability of young Ukrainian women. There's no Russian KGB soldier alive that can deal with that. The West can't handle it because apparently they're too scared to provide green cards or unwillingness to provide green cards. Ukraine, here's what I have to say. Ukrainian women, more specifically. Have you ever played poker? Now, the advantage of poker is not about the cards in your hand. I know people think it's about the cards. You can have the shittiest cards. I'm talking really shit cards in poker. And still win that shit. Hands down. It's the only thing where magic truly does exist in poker. You're saying purple people's out. If it's not about the cards, what is it about? We gotta have a good poker face. We gotta have a face that nobody can read. Nobody can sense it. Nobody knows. Ukrainian women have the best poker face at the poker table. They could have shitty cards. They could have the best cards. They can have maybe moderately decent cards. Nobody knows. They got 
like the best poker face. Putin is really good at sizing things up. And he's ruthless when he knows something's afoot. But it's pretty hard to be ruthless when you got a good poker face. Good luck out there in Kiev. We love you. Look, the next time we're there, please have a vegan option of bangers and mash. You didn't get it. It's an old Yankee joke.